but at some point the math is the math. I think we can do a better job using that information. It reinforces my belief that I have the best constituents. <laughs> Hello, Austin. Hello, District 6. Hello, Clawback Watchers. I hope you all have had a good week. It has been an intense one for the council. A uh, lot, lot of stuff to dig into, and we've got some great guests on the show today. Uh, Kate Moore, who is with both the Austin Tennis Council and ECHO. Uh, Skeeter Miller with the Austin Restaurant Association and the owner, and I believe, as he describes it, chief dishwasher at the county line, and then an amazing performance by Shelly Knight. But first, uh, as I like to begin the show, let's talk a little bit about the pandemic. I'm going to bring up the dashboards. Hopefully, we're all familiar with the, the, two app, the two dashboards that the city and the county publishes. And as I always like to remind folks, this, this dashboard, even though it says it's Travis County, it is all of the city of Austin, all of Travis County, including the part of the city that's in Williamson County, which is half of my district where I also live myself. So yes, Wilco Austinites, you are in this, in this math too. Um, you can see some good trending down in the new cases reported. Uh, we still have a, a challenge of the equity and the, the distribution of cases based on race. Uh, that top line right there is our Austin uh, Hispanic cases, which is far greater than the percent of population that is Hispanic in this community. A little bit of good trending uh, towards the mean, but honestly, you can start to see the, the the black community numbers start to tick up too. A lot of complicated issues that res as it relates to uh, the, the fairness and the, the distribution of cases in the community. But the uh, but the great chart is on the other one. I'm gonna click on it. Check that out my beautiful Austinites. Look at that curve coming back down. So this chart is the seven day moving average of hospital admissions, which among the very important data points that we are using to measure the progress of the pandemic, this is the one that is the trigger for whether or not we need to lock down more or we can start to be more uh, uh, cautious and have some more targeted reopenings and, and really kind of Getting, getting our arms and handle around it because of the availability of hospital resources. But even the data point itself, if you think about it, it ain't great. Like the fact that there are fewer people in the hospital doesn't mean we should seek to then add a lot more people to the hospital. But nonetheless, this is the chart that was established uh, many, many weeks ago about how we were going to make our decisions uh, as a city and mostly centered in the mayor's office based on how these kind of emergency orders work. But you can see we, we tipped up into that stage five for, for a little bit the numbers have trended back down. And I know some folks are, are concerned that uh, these data, that the data is somehow uh, wrong, that there were changes in federal reporting. And there's a lot of uh, conversation happening about that. And, you know, no data set is going to be perfect, but uh, these numbers are at least very encouraging. And I think more often than not, we can take uh, at least some joy that Austinites are wearing their masks and they're staying home they're not getting into large crowds. And y'all, we just got to keep it up. We just got to keep it up. We're doing such a great job. And this means fewer people will die. And, you know, there's a lot of challenge about how we're going to get through this pandemic and we need science to produce a vaccine and all the things. But um, proud, proud of you, Austin. Let's keep it up. Let's keep up the good work on that. Uh, there's other stuff. Let me get that down. Take my name off. There we go. Yeah, it's a very professional show as I narrate my own editing of it. Um, so what else happened this week? Oh yeah, we had a whole public hearing on the city budget and uh, there was just some really horrible drama over the weekend. And I'm not going to have a long conversation about Garrett Foster. I think there's been a lot of coverage in the media about it. Some of it better than others, uh, some of it worse. And, you know, I found it a little jarring to see some media reports uh, using a photo of of Garrett Foster uh, that was not in his veteran uniform, but the person who shot him, they were using a photo of him in uniform. And I think it just goes to show that those types of subtle messages can really inform how people interpret news reporting. And so I'm hopeful that future reporting will do justice by Garrett Foster at least and show him that as a veteran 
who was exercising both his First and Second Amendment rights by protesting and by carrying a weapon. And as APD has reported definitively, did not raise it, did not shoot it. Um, more details to be coming out about that later. Um, but beyond that case, which my hope is will be adjudicated in a court of law, that we're also talking about the budget. So in addition to everything else, several of us on the council put proposals, more specific proposals than have been put out before, put them up on the council message board. I'm going to bring up the council message board so that y'all can see what I'm talking about. So this is, where is it? Boom. So there are two websites I'm going to talk about, austincouncilforum.org and atxn.tv. This is the council message board. This is a place where council members and only council members and their staffs can post and engage with each other in a way that is open and transparent with the public. And the way the state law is written, actually, once we post on the message board, we can't edit it. It becomes a public record, a public document. So uh, I would say 99.9% .9 of the time when council members are putting stuff up on the message board, we mean it because there's no going back. So this is the, the main page, and then you can click on the message board, and you can see tons and tons and tons of content on here going back all the way, I think all the way back to 2017 or maybe in 2015, uh, where you can see posts by council members on a whole variety of topics as we head into either budget adoption or council meetings or other types of votes that we're going to take. Uh, the very top post, at least at the moment, because obviously more posts will move it around, is my proposal that I've titled the proposal to reconstruct and deconstruct. And uh, obviously this text is very small. Uh, but ultimately, it breaks down into two pieces. I'm going to take the screen off. Uh, it breaks down into two pieces. One is taking the uh, entirety of the police department, almost $440 million, in, uh, which is the largest department at the city by orders of magnitude. It is a ginormous piece of bureaucratic infrastructure. And instead of it being this massive single entity, breaking it into separate departments, that will allow additional oversight and transparency and, and accountability, but also more specific metrics and measurements around each uh, distinct area. So in my proposal, at least, you would have a uh, civilian department of commu co emergency communications and technology, and then sworn departments of patrol and investigations and traffic safety and professional standards. It's almost like a memory test. Even though I have it on my screen over here, I want to see if I can remember it, and I did. Um, those departments then would have their own uh, their own department head that was sworn, but then civilian leadership above it. And part of that is in response to how the state law is written about if you have sworn officers, uh, they have to have a sworn department head, and there are certain jobs that state law requires a sworn officer to be. But by breaking it into additional departments that are roughly the size of other city departments, it actually can help with the oversight and the distribution of power and influence kind of in the bureaucracy. So I'm excited about that proposal. It's going to be a good one. Uh, we'll see as we get into this next week how much of it is doable on short order and how much of it is going to take a little more time to build out the kind of bureaucratic infrastructure that's required when you set up departments. Um, the other proposal is one to uh, demolish the current APD headquarters and then use the property where that sits uh, as a uh, in a community-led process that would then hopefully further uh, uh, the economic success in the black community and help address historic inequities uh, and black in the in the black community in Austin, something that has been a problem. Austin is one of the most economically segregated cities in America. There are a lot of reasons for that, uh, and you go way back to the original segregation zoning in 1929 and problems with zoning ever since amongst other things, straight up racism notwithstanding. And there's a lot of stuff that can be done with that, but a community led process will determine that inevitable, inevitable outcome. But to that point, I, I wanna just say one more thing and then we'll bring on our first guest. I mean, this proposal to, to demolish the headquarters uh, is completely uncontroversial. In fact, that, that site where the headquarters exist also used to be the home of the municipal court. And prior to being the chair of the Public Safety Committee, which I am now, I was the chair of the Judicial Committee. And as chair of the Judicial Committee, we took a tour of the Muni Court, and it was, uh, in a word, decrepit. It was falling apart. There were uh, uh, plumbing and sewer issues. There were electrical issues. Uh, there were some ADA issues. The elevators kept breaking. Uh, even some asbestos panels in the basement. It was 
a mess. And it was uh, really problematic both to the staff that worked in that building and the public because because it was a municipal court, the public would be coming in quite frequently. And so we worked for two years to uh, get a new municipal court set up, which opened in April in the middle of the pandemic. So we didn't get to do a big fancy ribbon cutting. Um, but that was something that had been on the list of desires and needs of the city for, gosh, probably more than 10 years. And the same thing goes for the APD headquarters, that building, because it's basically the same building, uh, is, uh, is very much falling apart. It's no longer a useful, a useful building. Uh, at the same time, we have other office space in the city that is now uh, underused because we've built new buildings in the Miller neighborhood, one for Austin Energy, one for the Planning and Development Department. So this is mostly a response to fiscal responsibility of having a building that's taking a lot of money to maintain and prop up because it's falling apart, moving staff into existing underutilized space that the city already owns, and then engaging with both the community and private industry on how we can better utilize that piece of property, which is in a very geographically desirable location, being both downtown and adjacent to the future Waterloo Greenway and the future burying of I-35. So it's a pretty great, uh, it's a pretty great uh, idea. I'm excited about it. Um, but, you know, people uh, like to report things. They like to tell stories that are, in a word, untrue. And what you find, what I'm learning is there is an ecosystem of right-wing media. And the way that works is you, you'll have, you put out a proposal and then you have a group called, oh, I don't know, uh, dis, disinformationbattles.com. And Disinformation Battles writes a story and it says, uh, uh, council member wants to do something that sounds crazy. And then they write a story. And then that makes its way around the right-wing blogosphere. And then another site, uh, uh, Brett, Brett Beert. Brett, how, how do you, Brett, Brett Beert, I think is how you say it. Uh, they uh, then write it again, and then it makes another circle. And then, you know, at some point, I'm sure Fox News is going to call me and want to know why I want to set the whole of downtown on fire, which is inevitably how that game of telephone is played. But ultimately, Austinites, D6ers, what I'm telling you is read the message board, read the proposals, understand exactly what's going on. Don't let yourself be misinformed by incendiary headlines that are designed to create emotional reactions. Uh, we're actually doing really good work. And honestly, I believe possibly the most fiscally responsible movement in municipal policy, maybe in history. We're doing some really good stuff and it's going to be better for the taxpayers. And of course, ultimately better for black people and better for, better for our uh, communities of color and our BIPOC communities and all the folks that are, that are demanding significant change. So let's move on. Uh, well, there'll be a lot more to talk about. Uh, in fact, I'm going to put that back up on Tuesday the 4th and Thursday the 6th, next week, you will see live on ATXN TV, both a full council work session on Tuesday and a public safety committee meeting that I will chair on Thursday, digging into the details leading into the budget adoption the following week. So stay tuned for that. Okay, 13 minutes and I haven't even brought up my first guest yet. Let's get to that. All right, let me bring up uh, our first guest who is both, as I said earlier, uh, the board chair of the Austin Tenants Council, but also the vice president at Austin Echo. Let's welcome Kate Moore to the show. Hi, Kate. Hi, Jimmy. It's great to see you. It is so great to see you too. And I'm th so grateful for you for coming on the show today. Uh, first off, how how are you doing? We are many months in to a stay-at-home universe that uh, is just kind of bonkersville. And I'm curious how you and your family are doing. Is everybody okay? We're great. Um, you know, I, I'm staying at home. I have a 12 year old and a 15 year old both girls, and um, I think they're a little going a little stir crazy. But we're lucky. My husband and I are working from home, um, and we're staying safe. Uh, so we're doing just great. That, I'm so glad to hear that, Kate. Um, so you you have kind of two universes that that you operate in, although TBH they're very related ultimately. Um, first, why don't you just give the like the 10 cent version of your role at Echo, and then I want to talk about the Tenants Council. Great. So Echo is the um, is the lead agency for um, the local continuum of care. So we coordinate the homeless response system um, in the Austin Travis County area, and um, so that means we work and coordinate with um, providers who are um, providing vital services to people experiencing homelessness throughout the community. And um, we provide some funding that we coordinate through HUD, 
primarily. So um, I'm the vice president of strategic planning and partnerships there. So um, I get to be a part of strategic conversations and we've been really busy um, since the pandemic hit um, along with all of our community providers and the city of Austin, um, really working to support people experiencing homelessness who are at high risk for COVID-19. Well, that's obviously very important work. We're going to be both as a council on Tuesday having a long presentation about homelessness, as certainly as it relates to the budget. And I am very passionate about the role ECHO plays in this ecosystem, and, and I have made many public statements to that effect. The best way that this community is going to address and ultimately reduce homelessness to, and I can't remember exact phrase, Kate, it was uh, rare. Brief. It's rare. Brief. Brief and, and non-repeating. Non-reoccurring. Yep. Non-reoccurring. Rare, brief, and not rare. Rare, brief, and non-reoccurring. The yep. way we will do that is by letting Echo do its job, which is coordinating the ecosystem of service providers. So thank you for your work at Echo. But let's talk about the Tenants Council, because right. in addition to being a council member, up until uh, last year, I was the only renter on the city council. So renter issues are very close to my heart, as is to nearly or more than half of my district, depending on which math you use. Uh, who are also renters. So what does the Austin Tenants Council do? So the Austin Tenants Council um, is, uh, we're really lucky actually in Austin to have Austin Tenants Council. We provide um, fair housing mediation and we also do tenant landlord support. And um, there's not very many communities in the country and there's only one other community in the state that has a similar organization. Um, so one of the things we do is if somebody has believed that they have had a fair housing violation. So that means that they've been discriminated against based off of a protected class. So that means that based off of their gender, um, their sexual orientation, based off of their race, for instance, their disability status, um, they have a right um, to, um, to ask for a complaint and for that to be investigated. And so they come to us to understand their fair housing rights. Um, sometimes we um, can do further investigation um, sometimes we pass on investigations to HUD. Sometimes we do kind of secret shopper kind of investigations where if we've heard um, similar complaints about um, a property, we can go in and, and do some further investigation to, um, to find out more information. Um, but it's really important, you know, and I think that these times have really highlighted how um, racial discrimination is still very much alive, um, unfortunately, in our country, in our community and that we really need to hold each other accountable to, um, to the basic rights that we all have under the Fair Housing Act. Um, another piece that Austin Tenants Council does is really support um, renters. And so what we do is ensure that renters understand their rights um, and help them navigate being a renter. So um, we have staff a hotline um, and that number is, I wrote it down so I'd remember it, um, if you need um, assistance and you're a renter and you have a question, we have a hotline um, that's available during the day, Monday through Friday. It's 512-474-1961. Um, we also have online counseling if you go to our website, which is housingrights.org. Um, um, and that website, um, you can type your question in on an online basis and we'll have housing counselors that get back to you. So this is really um, a side of the business that has been really active and receiving a huge number of calls. Our staff has gone working remote from their homes and we're staffing our hotlines there and our online counseling there. We also do repair mediation, which is really important. So if you're, for instance, in the middle of this hot summer, your AC breaks and you've asked and request for your property manager to fix it, but you're not getting a response and you don't understand your rights, the last thing you want to do, for instance, is just stop paying your rent um, because then you've lost your rights um, in that situation. And so our our housing counselors can help you walk through. Is that, is that an example of what exactly are your rights? How They can provide you templates of letters, for instance, of how to move forward, negotiating that um, that repair issue. Um, and then a lot of right now that people are really concerned about is evictions. Um, so the city has been a great leader um, in the country and in the state at providing eviction protection. They've gone above and beyond what the country and the state has done. Um, there's been an eviction moratorium um, that I'm sure many of you are familiar with that the city has passed. Um, that's now gone through September. 
Um, but um, a lot of people may not understand their rights and may think that that just means that they don't have to pay their rent. So we're doing a lot of education around uh, making sure people understand that when that moratorium ends, that they still will be responsible for paying that rent and they could be evicted um, from their housing. So we're trying to do as much support as we can for renters um, during this COVID crisis. It's, it's, uh, it's been a very complicated question for folks and, and the pandemic has, has, I mean, it was complicated before mm-hmm. and, and the, the pandemic has just added this whole new, this whole new challenge of people losing their jobs and losing their income truly through no fault of their own. We have this, this thing that frankly, the Trump administration should have been prepared to solve because we were prepared to solve it as a nation in the past. There was some help in the last federal stimulus, the city very quickly stood up programs, one program, the RISE program, another program uh, for rental assistance, uh, amongst a lot of programs, some that were small business that I created or a nonprofit support one that uh, my colleague, Council Member Alter, helped put together, a uh, child care fund, a lot of different programs the city is standing up, a lot of it with federal dollars. There's another federal stimulus package being designed now. Are you hearing anything about the the conversation around renters at, at that level? So I really follow and I recommend um, the National Low Income Housing Coalition. They um, are great national advocates. Um, we're members at ECHO. I'm not sure if the Tenants Council is a member. We should be if we're not. Um, but they are um, really the champion for low income renters and people experiencing homelessness on the national level. And so following their um, following with their updates and their campaigns for for progress. Um, The HEROES Act has um, passed um, the House, but has not passed the Senate. Um, And it provides, the HEROES Act provides a tremendous amount of rental protections. And one of the things that we need desperately, both on the homeless response system and the low income renter side is rental assistance, right? So we know a lot of people have lost their jobs. They've been unable to pay rent and rent is gonna to come due sooner than later. And we need a we need an infusion of rental assistance. Um, and we have received some rental assistance as a community, right? Like the rise, rise funding from our local funds is an example, but we're gonna need more. And so the HEROES Act, for instance, if we can get um, some funding like in the HEROES Act or something similar, that would go a long way. So I encourage people to go to the National Low Income Housing Coalition website if you're interested in learning more or protect, protect potentially contacting your congressperson, um, that would be a great way to get connected. We're, we're trying to do everything we can at the local level. The Austin Tenants Council is such a great partner in that effort. And, and we in, in District 6 in far northwest Austin have often sent renters facing challenges uh, to your organization, uh, especially in, in our corner of the city. You don't sometimes know that these resources exist. Uh, and it's, you know, we have this suburbanization of poverty and you have these little pockets. We have two Title I elementary schools in uh, Anderson Mill and Live Oak Elementary. It's not that everybody in this corner of the city is, you know, wealthy and living on a golf course. It's it's far more complicated than that. And somebody's got to work at the HEB and somebody's working at the restaurant. Somebody's working at the at the retail place and, and working at the Starbucks. Like these are these are important jobs to keep our lives going, keep the economy going. And I think we're all learning that as a result of this pandemic. So, so I really would ask folks, you know, don't, don't just think about these issues as how they affect you personally. We are all very much learning that as a, as a city and as a community, we rely on folks who, who are doing different jobs than us and, and the support systems we build to help those folks both help keep the services going that we want, but also help avoid what I hope is not a coming wave of homelessness as it relates to pandemic and rental bills and all those other pieces. And at the end of the day, unfortunately, the federal government is kind of the only place with the financial scale to really help address this problem at that level. We're doing everything we can at the local level. And and thanks, Kate, for the Austin Tenants Council and ECHO for being a partner with the city in all of those efforts. Any Any parting words for folks that you want them to know? I can bring up the phone number again, too. Yeah, if you could bring up the phone number and to please um, contact um, the Austin Tenants Council if you ha- if you need assistance or if you know anybody else that does. And um, please don't hesitate to advocate on the federal level for, for more funding coming our way. So I really appreciate you inviting me on and letting me talk about these issues and your support. Thank you, Jimmy. 
Thanks, Kate. Send my love to everybody on the team. Thank you. Boop. Uh, let me get that down. Yeah, so the Austin Tenants Council, you know, we, we provide a little bit of city support to that group, but ultimately people have rights. They have rights that are enshrined in state law, some that are enshrined in local ordinance. And, you know, not everybody can go out and hire an attorney every time something gets a little weird. So it's great to have nonprofit organizations like that at the ready to make sure people know how to access all of the rights uh, and the processes that are defined. So renters, if you're watching, uh, know that if you get into some trouble, that group is there to help you as well. And you can always contact my office and we'll send you their way. Uh, we have a musical guest this week. Last week, uh, uh, we had some technical challenges. We did it without a musical guest. It just didn't, I mean, it was great. Our two guests that were there, and we had a really beautiful conversation, but it doesn't feel like a clawback unless we have some live music involved. So I'm so excited to bring on our musical guest today, Shelly Knight. Hi, Shelly. Hi, Jimmy. It is so great to have you on the show. First, how are you and your family doing? How are you making it through? Is everybody healthy? Everybody safe? Yes, everybody's healthy and safe. Um, my music and life partner, Fred, and I <laughs> have been hunkered down. We've been uh, doing some recording and some writing uh, while we're kind of stuck at home. I adopted a couple of dogs, so, you know. <laughs> And we're my, lucky enough that my son plays drums, so we haven't had to get together with the full band uh, since my son and Fred and I have been quarantined together. Um, we, uh, we've we been, you know, able to perform and do some live streams because we have a kid that plays drums. So we were able to, like, kind of form a little band here among the family, so. That is amazing. <laughs> that, like, you, that has got to be, a, a for, like, so fortunate compared to a lot of musicians that, that, you know, they're having to do background tracks or looping or whatever to, to kind of make their, their music go. But you, you guys are, are built for this in some way, somehow. <laughs> yeah, but we brought him up to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess so. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, so also I, I, I understand that you were about to release an album right before the shutdown happened. Yes. It's how, so how, how are you coping with that? And, and what are your plans to release it? Um, well, right now I'm kind of like, should we do it or not? You know, because, uh, before COVID, you know, we were playing three, four times a month. We had seven shows that week of South by, uh, and it, everything just kind of came to a halt. And I thought, okay, the last thing people are going to do right now is buy music. So I may just put it up on Spotify and let people listen to it for free. And if they really want it, they can buy it. Um, I'm not going to make any money off of it. I know that. And everybody's in a spot right now where they're, you know, they're just trying to survive. And so, you know, luxuries like music, you know, they're probably not going to spend the money on because they need groceries or whatever. But um, I want to do it this fall. Who knows what's going to happen? Who knows if there's going to be clubs left to even play at? We can only hope with so many closing. It's so sad uh, for the music community because as it is, it was very hard to get gigs as it was because there are thousands and thousands of musicians and only a handful of places to play. And now there's going to be even a smaller number of clubs to play at. So the competition's pretty tight to get into some of these places. And I'm hoping that a lot of them can stick around, but it's, you know, it's no fault of their own. They had to close. And, you know, you think about all the people that, you know, you sound guys you've worked with and bartenders you've seen at the club and, the friends you've made and you're thinking, gosh, how are these people getting by? And you know, your heart goes out. Just it's, it's a, it is tough. And, and, you know, right. The, the day that, that the mayor, mayor Adler canceled South by, which, which again, I think was the right decision and yes. may go down in history as one of the moments that the nation took it seriously. Credit to mayor Adler for that. That night I was convening stakeholders in my office to talk about how to protect the music industry from, from South by's closure. Cause it was not lost on me or really anybody yeah. that, that this, might be an inevitable future in a pandemic. And, and here we are, we stood up some programs, but ultimately like with our last guest, uh, the scale of the problem really requires federal intervention. And there is some, some movement there. And so I'm, I'm hopeful. The, the other thing I wanted to ask you before, before we hear what, what y'all have to play, uh, you also have a day job. Yes. As most and so, do. <laughs> yeah. So, so tell me, tell me about your, your day job. And I'm curious if you incorporate your music into your, uh, into your work. Yes, I do. Uh, I am a kindergarten teacher and uh, I do play the guitar for the kids. And it's one of the best parts of uh, teaching kindergarten is being able to share music with the kids. And they just 
love it so much. But um, yeah, I'm a teacher and uh, it's been kind of a weird year <laughs> to say the least. Um, you know, when everything happened in March, we had to kind of, what's the word using pivot to the online uh, thing. And uh, I had to learn a lot like overnight how to do things. And I was kind of forced into using more technology because that's the only way you could reach the kids. But these little guys, these five and six year olds, they figured that stuff out pretty quick. So if anything comes from this, uh, besides keeping the kids safe and doing the online school, is that they're going to be very tech savvy. Because even at five years old, they could figure out how to record themselves and send me pictures of their work. And, and it was really, really cute. I mean, the first few weeks was like nothing but tech support for parents. But after that, it was really cool to be able to still connect with my students. And that's a big part of kindergarten is building that community, building those relationships. And uh, when they would, you know, say, here's my picture and I love you, but that's not part of the assignment. <laughs> and it was just that's really adorable. Cute. But I, I did miss them, and I really hope that we can find a way to get, especially the younger students, especially uh, the students that are struggling, uh, students that are affected by homelessness, uh, students that are in the special education program. I really hope that we can get back in person safely uh, as soon as possible. And I, I'm hoping that with the tr with the trend now, with COVID going down, that we're going to be able to do that. So. I, I hope so too. And if everybody keeps wearing their masks and yeah. keeps taking it seriously, then hopefully we'll get to that place. Thank you for being a teacher. It is, it is, you know, they say it's a thankless job. I don't think people fully understand how thankless it can be sometimes. Yeah. Um, thank you for doing that. Um, it's, thank it's, and, and maybe never harder than it is right now. And kindergarten, I can't, I can't even imagine that's <laughs> it, my, it, my chief of staff has two, two young kids and just hearing the stories of, of what she's having to do. Um, <laughs> I, 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 all my heart and love comes out, goes out to you, Shelly, for doing that work. Sure. I, you know, I just, I'm kind of concerned about uh, social distancing with five-year-olds and the mask wearing, because I have a feeling they're going to be playing with them you know, more than, you know, it's not a slingshot. It's not a hat. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, that's them. a challenge. It's going to be tough, but uh, we're teachers. We figure it out. We adapt. And that's what we had to do this spring. And that's what we're doing now. And it's all for the health and safety of uh, staff, parents, kids. And, uh, we're, you know, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. And the kids will catch up. If some of them are falling behind, that's what we do. We push the kids to get them on grade level and we work with them and we intervene and that's part of the job. So we'll figure it out. We always do. We're teachers. So that, that's, that's awesome. Well, well, thank you so much for being a teacher and, and good luck as you get back to your kids. Thank you. you have a song prepared for us now. I, I am, I am so excited. Uh, yes. you and Fred, uh, and I don't know if your son is playing no, or if he's out. Right <laughs> he's not here. Okay. Well, I, I can't wait to hear what y'all have prepared. So why don't you take it away? Okay. This song's called 15 years and it was off of our first CD and uh, you can listen to it on Spotify if you want. Just look up this one, Shelly Knight and the Living Dead. And you will find it on Spotify. You can listen for free. We're also on Facebook and uh, Instagram and all of that stuff. So this song's called 15 Years. <laughs> Fifteen years, where to go? Fifteen years, I didn't know I was young, now I'm old Fifteen years, went too slow Time is a river, time is a wheel Roll on by me like flowing steel Fifteen years got by me somehow Who I was then's not who I am now Fifteen year old photograph You and me baby after class, not the same now you lost your light. 
15 years gone out of sight Time is a river, time is a wheel Roll on by me like flowing steel 15 years got by me somehow Who I was then is not who I am now. I was so in love with you back then. Now I don't even think I can call you a friend. No, no. That was awesome. Thank you for having and, me. Well, thank you for being on the show. And I think possibly my first musical guest where it was more than one person. So <laughs> that was really awesome. And uh, yeah, everybody go check out Shelly's uh, uh, album on Spotify and wherever you can buy music. And then if you ever release your second album, please sure uh, be sure to let me and my staff know and I'll, I'll signal boost it for you. I will. If you follow us on Facebook or Twitter, Instagram, uh, just look up Shelly Knight. Uh, we'll let you know if we're going to do another live stream. I'm hoping to do one um, in the next month and then also get the album out hopefully by October, Rocktober. I'm hoping things come back around by then. So keep that's exciting. Up. Thank you. And thank you, Fred, thank for you. coming on the show today. Thank you, guys. Bye. I love Gavin live music on the show. That's so cool. It feels so much more Austin and so much, uh, so much better than, than, just having to talk about policy the whole time. But let's talk about a little more policy since our, since we're still here. Uh, we've got one of my friends uh, uh, who, who runs a cultural icon in this community and now is the president of the Greater Austin Restaurant Association, Skeeter Miller. Hi, Skeeter. Hey, Jimmy. How are you doing? I, I, I really appreciate you uh, having me on. I, uh, you know, a guy that makes potato salad for a living, you know, they don't let me out much. And uh, that's what it is. I thought it was washing dishes. It's baked potato salad for a yeah, living. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I switch off. I, I, I go, I go do both. But uh, anyway, one, do, one thing I do want to thank you 
for is that, you know, you've always had uh, an open door policy for the Restaurant Association. You know, anytime we've had an issue, uh, we always give you a call and you've always been, been there to meet with us and, and, uh, and listen. So that we do appreciate that. Thank, thank you, Skeeter. It's my, my pleasure. You know, the, the, the members that you represent through the Restaurant Association, when folks think of iconic Austin businesses, they often think of restaurants first. And, and that's never that's never lost on me. And beyond the, the, the ones that come to top of mind, there's a whole community of restaurants that support our neighborhoods in small ways, that support the city in a big way. And, and one of the industries that undeniably hardest hit by, by the pandemic. Before we get into that, though, how are you and your family doing? We're doing great. Uh, we're, you know, we're healthy. Uh, we're, we're doing all the right things. We're, uh, you know, we finally got to see the grandkids, which was great, right? And, uh, and we were kind of glad when they went back home. Uh, so uh, we, had a good, <laughs> we had a good time with them. So we're doing good, and, and I, hope, I hope you're doing the same. I appreciate you asking. Thank you. Yes, and me and, and my boyfriend, Zach, are, 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 are great. He works at HEB, which comes with its own set of challenges during a pandemic, sure. but at least we are so far been, been safe. So t t first, tell folks, you know, what, is, what is the Austin Restaurant Association? What does the association do? And then what are you hearing from your members? Well, we, you know, the, the Greater Austin Restaurant Association is a part of the Texas Restaurant Association. We're actually a metro chapter, and there's chapters all across the state. And, uh, you know, we're here to represent our industry, the hospitality industry, the hotel industry. We're, we're here to, uh, you know, to, to have an ear and have a voice, basically, uh, within advocacy or whatever it may be. Uh, it's very challenging right now. Uh, the, you know, just Austin alone, uh, when County Line started, this is our 45th anniversary, uh, there were 600 restaurants. Uh, as of today, there's close to 7,000 restaurants. So there's a lot of people. We're one of the biggest, I think we're the second largest employer in the U.S. And so, you know, our, our industry has been devastated. And I, and I know you've seen the, the restaurants that have have had to close their doors, uh, iconic restaurants like Shady Grove, Botticelli's, uh, Thread Gills. And so, you know, we're just hanging on, we're just hanging on by a thread. And, and I think most important to, to us, or at least with the county line is, you know, I'm really proud of the fact that, you know, our average management tenure for our company is uh, almost 37 years. So most of the kids that I hired when they were 16 still work here. Same goes for all of our staff. And so, you know, it's extremely important for us and other restaurants that we keep kids employed. We keep uh, keep people in a job. And that's really been difficult, uh, especially when, you know, our business basically was just shut down. And, uh, you know, I understand the reasoning behind it, and I understand why it happened. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I think one of the things that really affects us the most is a lot, there's a lot of fear tactics going on, you know, in the media that were, you know, don't go out and eat, don't go, don't go to restaurants. And, and I think, I think that the message that, that I want to send is, is that we, we're, there's some really good actors in our industry. Okay. And sometimes, the media focuses on maybe the bad actors. And, you know, at our restaurant, we we are doing like hundreds of things to make sure that my employees are safe and the customers are safe. And I understand when customers don't feel comfortable going out to eat, but they can come and get curbside. And, and our team is out there. They're putting it in the trunk. You don't have to touch anything. And I mean, that's, that's helping us survive. And, you know, when your business has been cut in half and so you know and i'm not only operate in austin but san antonio and in new mexico you know the laws are all different in, in all those places and so uh it's a juggling act and there's a lot of uncertainty but i know we're going to get to where we we need to be as long as people listen to uh the rules and the regulations and i think i think once something that's really important to us is is the consistency with the regulations between state and local government you know because you know we're, we're kind of bobbing back and forth of what should we do how do we do it and those kind of things and so you know and then you've got i have over 500 employees uh so you know I've, i'm trying to be positive with them that things are going to come back you know you're going to be able to you're going to be okay and so um you know that's I just want to send a positive message, you know, and, and we appreciate uh, everything that uh, you all are doing and, and just 
you know, being open only 50% is better than not being open at all. I have to tell you that. Well, and that's, and that's important because there were definitely questions when we were talking about 25% that it might not be better than being open. Just you get those, the economies of scale about at what point does it even make sense to staff and to have the food in the coolers and unpredictable demand. And, and, you know, I think that for you to be on the show today is really good timing because we're watching that hospitalization graph creep into an earlier stage. So can you, can you tell folks some of the things restaurants are doing that, that they believe will help folks feel more comfortable and actually protect them as we contemplate going back into 50% opening and, and having folks indoors at restaurants? Yes. I, you know, I think, I think for us, it's just super important that, that we're doing everything we possibly can to make sure that everything is sanitized and sanitary inside the restaurants. We don't have condiments on the table. We have uh, team members that are, you know, sanitizing the, 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 uh, the handles on the doors when people come and go, the restrooms are being sanitized on a absolute minute by minute basis. Uh, all of the menus are paper menus. We've, we've all reduced our menus down. Most restaurants have, so you don't have a lot of inventory on hand. So you, you know, you really, you, when the customer comes in, they get to pick what they want, you know, no condiments on the table. The silverware is all sanitized and kept in the back. Uh, tables are chairs. Everything is sanitized between the customers. Uh, all our employees are wearing masks. We have san uh, sanitizer stations all over the restaurant and out in the outdoor areas that people feel more comfortable picnicking outside. So all of the restaurants are, are, are doing this. And, and uh, you know, that's, that's, that's the message that we want to let them know that we're here for you. We want you to be safe as well as our employees to be safe. So we're going to do everything we can to make sure that we do that. Well, what, what are the what are the kind of final thoughts you want to share with the community? Um, you know, I, I think Austin is is doing a good job protecting itself, and I think that might open the door to more folks being comfortable uh, as we kind of get back into these lower hospitalization rates and to a place where the virus transmission has really curtailed. Um, and I say, just for my own for my own you know approach. I definitely try and order takeout and order delivery and from local restaurants, locally owned restaurants is kind of as much as I can. Um, I did go through a period, I think a lot of people went through, it was like, I'm gonna cook everything from home. I'm gonna cook all my food at home now. And uh, that was fun for like three weeks. And then it was like, uh, I really miss like the food from this place that I really like. And I miss the style of barbecue that a county line and I miss this. So um, I think that a lot of folks are still doing that, but. I know for at least my family and for me and Zach, we really do miss the restaurant experience, just being able to go out and have, have a meal and a cocktail and um, really enjoy certainly the, the, the vistas and the views that you have at your restaurant, but even just being out in the community. So what are your, what are your kind of final thoughts for the, for the public? Well, I just, uh, we, we have, we have to get out, but be safe and come, come. And I, and, and the people in Austin have been so supportive for for us and other restaurants and i mean that's what's kept us alive and so if you if you don't feel comfortable going out and sitting inside a restaurant we have a lot of beautiful restaurants in this city uh, uh mine in particular uh that uh, you can sit outside and enjoy a view have a margarita your your distance your social distance plenty of room between folks and enjoy being out and uh and that shows other people that it's okay to get out. And, and I, and, 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 you know, that's, what's going to get us to come back. I mean, 45 years of doing this, I thought I had seen almost everything, <laughs> but this is a new one. This is a new one. Well, thank, thank you, Skeeter, for a number of things. One, for being such a good advocate for your industry and your members for running and maintaining such an iconic organization in the county line, keeping your employees employed, which as we're seeing, not everybody is able to do that, but thank you for, for being able to do that for your folks. And and finally, for being a member of the LGBT Chamber of Commerce and and knowing that your, your restaurant serves a very wide audience and that diversity is an important value for your employees and for your customers. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And and we're we're tickled that we're a part of, the, of that community and diversity is a huge, huge aspect of the Line restaurants. And thanks a bunch for having me, appreciate it. Thank you so much, Skeeter, be safe. Okay, take care. A lot, a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff happening, y'all. There's a lot of things going on. You know, all, all my, my kind of wishes and good luck to, to our local businesses that are trying to make it. We have stood up a few programs at the city, some that I have led on, like 
the Small Business Support Fund and a fund for small businesses to cover the additional costs of compliance and, and cleaning in order to keep jobs going, keep have, having people keep their paychecks and doing it in a way that protects their employees and protects the customers that are going into those businesses. A um, lot of stuff happening. And there's a few comments I want to show. Um, uh, uh, Jeff Stenslin, good friend of mine, talking about the Tenants Council. Thanks to, to Skeeter, Tina Cannon from the LGBT Chamber. Uh, Jennifer, great, great to see you watching the show. Uh, MJ, I see your question. Um, we've talked about this in, in the council meetings. Uh, we have empty buildings right now. One Texas Center, which used to house the Planning and Development Department, which is now in a new building in the Miller neighborhood. And then there's the Austin Energy Building on Barton Springs, which will be a new building in the Miller neighborhood. There actually are uh, empty or soon to be empty buildings. Um, there, there are definitely plans. These are not high level uh, with no meat behind them. That's exactly the work that we're trying to do. And again, uh, you can watch uh, the council in its next budget work session on Tuesday the 4th. You can watch me chair the next public safety committee meeting on Thursday the 6th. Both of those uh, streaming live atxn.tv and you can read more details on the council proposals that are being published on austincouncilforum.org. And of course, we are on the campaign trail a uh, big election heading into November. Uh, please sign up and support the campaign. List yourself as a public supporter. Make a donation if you can. Uh, sign up to volunteer. There's a lot of good work to be done. Uh, we've done so much for this district. Uh, stay tuned to jimmyflanagan.com as we start rolling out our second term policy proposals, as well as the accomplishments from the first term, which even when I was putting the list together, couldn't. I, I was shocked to see how many things I had done I had already forgotten about. So much, so much good work for this district and for the city, and we want to keep that going. Thanks, everybody, for watching the show. We keep creeping this thing up to close to an hour. Uh, either you like it or you don't like it, but there's a lot of good content. Uh, please like and share, subscribe on YouTube, and we will see you all next week.